You hear that laugh? That's nothing other, that's no, no other than the Honorable Desmond Tutu. Only laugh like that in the world. <laughs> Good evening. See, there's a problem already. You see, I come from the black church. Somebody said, yeah. <laughs> and in the black church, we have seek and respond. In other words, I'm not here to talk to you. I'm here to talk with you. Yeah. So let's try one more time. No impromptu. So let's try, let's try this one more time. Good evening. Good now you're all honorary black people. You're all cool. I'm deeply honored to be with you tonight. This is a special, special time. It's also a very troubling time. And I'm remembered at moments like this, that rainbows only follow storms. You know about that, a little bit about that in a place like Finland, that rainbows only follow storms. You cannot have a rainbow without a storm first. I'm reminded of when I was growing up in Compton, California, in South Central Los Angeles. And as my man Pekka would call the hood, it's a very honorable place to grow up. And my mom and my dad were just incredible people, are incredible people. My mother told me she loved me every day of my life. Nothing more powerful than a child being told that they are loved. And from my mother, I got this quote, there's a difference between being broke and being poor. Being broke is economic, but being poor is a disabling frame of mind and a depressed condition of your spirit and you must vow never, ever, ever to be poor again. For my mother, I got this incredible sense of, yes, I am. My dad is an incredible man, an entrepreneur, has owned his own business for 54 years. And for my dad, I got a, a powerful sense of, yes, I can. Yes, I can. And so, because of my dad, I was a businessman when I was, well, I wanted to be a businessman when I was 10 years of age. And, I used to, and I was 10 years of age, my, I didn't, I, we didn't have much money, so my, my, my mother used to dress me funny. She made these purple, crushed velvet, velour suits. Still traumatizes me to this day with a ruffled shirt and a big, 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 big bow tie. And sent me to school in Compton, California, next to Watts, dressed like that. I got beat up every single day. What are you, what are you clapping for? What, what is wrong with this audience? What are you I got beat up. There was no dignity in this. But it caused me to understand that eagles don't fly in packs, that you've never seen a flock of eagles. And eagles are high-altitude birds. There are three types of birds. There are eagles, there are buzzards, and there are turkeys. <laughs> eagles are high-altitude birds. They're regal. There's a, it's not arrogant, they're not pompous, but there's a certain regalness to an eagle, very much like these two beautiful ladies sitting right here. You're picking on me, I'm going to pick on you. And <laughs> then you've got another kind of bird. It's a buzzard. Buzzards love packs. Buzzards are low-altitude birds. Buzzards are always stepping on your head to elevate themselves. Always, as we would say in my neighborhood, player hating, never player congratulating. Always have something negative to say about somebody. But the worst kind of bird, the worst kind of bird is a turkey. Because the turkey's got wings and can't even fly. All they do is profile, translation, trying to be something they are not. So I grew up with these images. and. The other side of the story, so I was 10 years old, I started the neighborhood candy house, made $300 a week selling candy. Then I lost, I, I, found, I was successful, I made some money and found girls and lost a business. That's a whole other story. But it gave me a great sense of yes, I can, and yes, I am, and yes, I could do. But the other side of the story was my mom and dad fought over money. 
number one cause of divorce is money. And my mom and dad didn't finish school, not because they didn't want to go to school, but because it wasn't stressed in their generation. And because my, my mom and dad were, were excited about being entrepreneurs, we owned this property, but we lost it all. We lost the gas station we owned. We lost the apartment building we owned. We lost our own home. We didn't lose their home. We lost our home. And as a result of that, decisions were changed. My brother went to the military versus going to a private university because that's the only way he could get a college education. And all these stories played out differently in my life. And all around me was prison, probation, and parole because choices were limited. And I wonder what would have happened, and we lost it all, if my dad had been given financial literacy courses growing up. He was taught the language of money. If society cared enough about him to invest in him, to gain a knowledge about money so that he could today be employing people creating a tax base, helping the revitalized community. And where today I take care of my dad, I wonder if today my dad would be taking care of others. How would life be different? So in my book, I say that loss creates leaders. I also just told you rainbows only follow storms. So what am I doing today? It's no accident. I'm teaching financial dignity around the world. We've taught 1.5 million people, but whatever goes around comes around. So I'm doing a mission that is tied to, to my loss. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I want to start a cancer foundation. Who starts cancer foundations? I, I told you I'm used to the black church. I'm talking to you. <laughs> who starts cancer foundations? People who have cancer. Who, who else? People whose love, relatives who have cancer, people who love those who have cancer, and those who have had cancer. Rainbows only follow storms, and loss creates leaders, and whatever goes around comes. Now you're getting it. This is you. We are the world. We are the few. You're coming around. And, and so today my life makes sense, but. But the minute you think you know everything, at that moment you know nothing. And so I was in India, and I was teaching a, a course on leadership in India, and I, I, I had gone to this, this, this uh, university, and I had spoke there, and after I left, I, I got back to the, to, the, to, the, uh, to the hotel, and I realized I didn't have my wallet. And so I called the hotel, and I said, can you please bring the car back? They have my wallet. And they said, I'm sorry, sir, we don't have a car. That was a taxi we used. And so they tried calling the taxi company, nobody answered the phone. They tried again, and nobody answered the phone. And I became a little cynical. I went from hopeful to skeptical to cynical, and I started thinking the worst of people. And of course, they said, well, my, my wallet is gone. By midnight, they called and said, we're still trying. He's not answering the phone, the taxi cab driver. But at 2 in the morning, they called and said he answered his phone. His phone was off. He's coming back to your hotel with your wallet. So I get dressed, and I run down stairs and a man meets me and the bellman translates in for me in India in the dialect and, and, I, and I ask the man, well, how, and I get my wallet and everything is in my wallet, everything, my passport, my money, my credit cards, it's all there and I reach into my wallet and there's $70 US. I ask the man through a translator, what do you make a month? He says about 2,500 rupees, which about, with that time, which is about $70 US. So I reach out and I say, let me give this $70 to you. This is my way of saying thank you. And the man says, no. I said, no, I don't think you understand. I have one month's salary for you. I want to say thank you. Here's $70. And the man says to the translator, no. And I said, there must be a translation problem here. <laughs> I'm talking about paying you. I'm talking about giving you a month's worth of your salary. One more time, he said, and this time he became a little visibly angry. He said, angry. He said, I told you no. I didn't bring you your wallet because I wanted a reward. I brought you your wallet because it's your wallet. Now, this may not sound like an incredible story, but think what would have happened if I had lost my wallet in a taxi in New York City or a big city anywhere in, in the world. Think about what a, the chances of me getting my wallet back. Think about it and be honest with yourself now. This is a slum, so it, as they call it, in India. So I said to the man, what can I do to be thankful to you? What can I do to say thank you? He said, well, the next time you're in India, come to my house and have tea. Be my friend. Whew. 
Sometimes when you give, you get. Sometimes whatever goes around comes around. And so Ubuntu, as they say in South Africa, Ubuntu, I am me because you are you. I didn't give that man a thing. He gave me a sense of purpose. He let me understand that there's hope in people and that you can believe in the humanity and the decency of people. And sometimes people just do things because of the right thing to do. What if we all just made a commitment to be someone's friend, to show up in their house and have tea, or better, to invite them into our house and make that connection? What does connection mean? Last story. I'm in Harvard at the Young Global Leaders uh, meeting, and there's different countries, 70 different countries represented there, and talking about nuclear disarmament. And one of the people says, well, what would you, in, in uh, I think it was India, what would you want to do uh, with nuclear disarmament? Well, I, I'd want to have a nuclear weapon. And then, of course, Pakistan would say, if India wants a nuclear weapon, I, I want a nuclear weapon. And then, of course, Iraq said, if Iran has a nuclear weapon, I want a nuclear weapon. And you, you get the story here. Then Russia said, well, if America has nuclear weapons, then we want to have a nuclear weapon. And after a while, everybody's hand was up saying, I want to have a nuclear weapon. And then I asked this question. What if we're no longer members of individual countries? What if we're now just global citizens? What if we're all part of the same family? Now, who wants to have a nuclear weapon? The answer was zero. You see, it really does make sense. Because whatever goes around, comes around. This thing we're going through right now is not a recession. It's a reset. It's not an economic crisis. It's a crisis of virtues and values. This is not about the failure of free enterprise and capitalism. It's about the failure of greed. When we treated, all of us in the world treated people like transactions and not like relationships, you end up with what we have now. When it's about me and not about we, it's about what we have to get versus what we have to give. When it's about getting rich and not building wealth. When it's about the little we can get paid right now and about me and not about we, you end up with a world that's lost its storyline. Are you with me so far? You gain more by giving. You get more by building. You learn more by listening. We have a chance and an opportunity to change the world because nobody changes in good times. People only change in bad times. No one changes when they're comfortable. They change when they're uncomfortable. We have a chance now to change the world. And so here's my question as I wrap up, and I'm now going to come right to you. I'm going to ask you what kind of bird do you want to be? But I want you to answer in your own dialect, in your own word. But I'm going to start with something easy, and you're going to repeat after me. I can change the world. I can change the world. I will be the change in the world. I will be the change in the world. You guys sound really weak. <laughs> Talk like you got passion in your life. Talk, oh my God. <laughs> Remember now, you're honorary black people, you gotta have some soul. I'm gonna ask you one more time. I am somebody. I am somebody. I can change the world. I can change the world. I am. I am. Question, what kind of bird do you want to be? Eagle. No, no, say it with passion. What kind of bird do you want to be? Eagle. Give them a round of applause.